calling all detectives. A private detective like me, Jerry Browning, has this in common with a doctor. A lot of the work he does is for free. I straightened up in my seat as white-haired Judge Eli Whitney Rockmore took his place. A moment later, the jury filed back in and handed down the decision I was sure they would. We, the jury, find the defendant, Robert Heil, guilty as charged. In his chambers, and with his judicial robe tossed over the back of the chair, Judge Eli Whitney Rockmore looked like just what he was. A very tired old man who had seen far more than his share of human suffering. Were you able to get any of the information I wanted, Jerry? I nodded. Yes, I did, sir, but I don't think you're going to like it. The judge smiled wryly. You mean this boy, Hyle, is really guilty? I hated to say it, but I had to. I located two witnesses who saw Hyle walk into the gas station and that the state's attorney never got around to calling because he didn't need them. Furthermore, just about a year ago, Bob Hyle's brother was killed while attempting very much the same kind of holdup. I paused. You want me to go on? Judge Rockmore shook his head. No, I'm afraid that's enough. I have no choice but to pass sentence on this boy. But just the same, Jerry, if he's guilty, then I've learned nothing in my 35 years on the bench. In spite of the overwhelming evidence against a prisoner, old Judge Rockmore did not think he was guilty. Robert Hyle... This court sentences you to serve a period of not less than five years, nor more than ten years at hard labor. The court is adjourned. Well, that should have been the end of it. But when a man like Judge Rockmore, who spent 35 years on the bench, tells me that he thinks he's sentencing an innocent man, then my conscience begins to nag me. I had a long talk with Warden Hazelton, who told me, I would say that Bob Hyle's an average prisoner, Mr. Browning. He's not asked for any special favors, except to be transferred from the laundry to the tailor shop. How does he get along with the other prisoners, Warden? The warden shrugged. Quite well. He's been making friends of some hardened criminals, I'm sorry to say. Why do you ask these questions, Mr. Browning? I shrugged. I wish I knew, Warden. There's something peculiar about Hyle, and I thought maybe up here I could find out what it was. But I guess I was wrong. When I got back to town, I went to see Judge Rockmore at his home, told him about my visit to the pen. He listened silently, nodded his head a few times. When I'd finished... Jerry, you mentioned that Hyle's brother had been killed while attempting a similar holdup. What do you know about that case? Not too much, sir. His brother was one of three men who held up a big gas station, killed an attendant. Police came up as they were making a getaway. Hyle's brother was shot and killed. He drove the getaway car and shot the attendant, according to the other two. Judge Rockmore nodded. Where are these others now? Judge, I'm afraid they're at the penitentiary, and I think there's going to be more murder. Judge Rockmore had warned me not to say or do anything more, and I didn't for about a week. Then I couldn't stand it any longer, called Warden Hazelton at the pen. What I heard almost knocked me out of my chair. A few hours earlier, three men had escaped. They were Bob Heil, Joe Marsh, and Fred Reedon, the two men who had participated in the holdup with Bob's brother. All three had worked in the tailor shop and escaped by slugging a guard and stealing a truck. The men had last been seen heading for town. A story made big headlines, and the way the newspapers told it, Bob Heil deliberately went to jail in order to help his brother's gang escape. It didn't make much sense to me. But then nothing about Hyle had made any sense right from the start. Then, a week after the escape, I got a call from Judge Rockmore to come over to his house at once. I found Judge Rockmore alone in his study. Sit down, Jerry. I want to ask you a question. Suppose you were a young, unemployed ex-soldier. You drove into a gas station, and as you did... Two men jumped into your car, held a gun to your head, and told you to start driving. What would you do? I guess I'd start driving, Judge. And suppose that these two men realized that capture was inevitable, that one of them had committed a murder, that it was necessary to sacrifice somebody in order to save their own lives. 
if they killed you and swore that you were not only their accomplice, but guilty of murder as well. Who could possibly prove the contrary? I put my hand in my pocket, felt the reassuring touch of my revolver. Judge, where is Bob Hyle? The judge stood up. Take your hand out of your pocket, Jerry. Bob, come in here. Bob Hyle walked into the room, stood facing me. Tell him, Bob. The boy turned to me. I know my brother wasn't involved in that hold-up or killing. He just wasn't that kind of person. I thought if I could get at the two men, become their friend, sooner or later I'd learn the truth. I shook my head. It's no use, Hyle. Maybe you're telling the truth, maybe not. It makes no difference. You're a con now, an escaped con, which is worse. Where are Marsh and Raiden? They're holed up in a little shack not far from here. I go out every night for food. They're too frightened to step out of the place. He smiled at the judge, who smiled back. An awful thought began to form at the back of my head. Wait a second. You made friends with these two men, and the three of you walked out of the state pen just by slugging a guard and stealing a truck. The walls are 18 feet high. They've got 62 such lights and 118 guards. I turned to the judge. Judge Rockmore, how could you do this to me? Jerry, it was the only chance to clear an innocent man's name and to catch his murderers. After you came back from the penitentiary and told me that Bob had applied for a transfer to the tailor shop, I drew my own conclusions and was in communication with Warden Hazelton. We arranged the jailbreak with Bob. And I even provided the hideaway place and the necessary recording apparatus to take down conversations. This evening they confessed to Bob, and nothing now remains except to retake them. The judge grinned at me. In gratitude for your share in the case, you may have the honor of recapturing them, if you wish. I took a deep breath. Judge, I think you're a terrific guy. One of the greatest I've ever known. And all I have to say is that let us now please phone for three or four carloads of cops. And that was the end of it. Like I said, another thing that a detective has in common with a doctor is that people are always holding out information on both of them. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. 